The Power Factor Show with Rick, Steve, and Caleb. Episode 67. You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. Brought to you by Safariland and Hodgton. The Gunpowder People. Welcome to the Power Factor Show. I'm Caleb. I'm Rick. And we're going to start today's show with an IDPA-style prize giveaway, which is appropriate because we're talking about prizes and awards on today's show. Exactly. So, Rick, tell them what we've got here. What we have here is the wonderful Safariland 079-53-6 mag pouch. Two, two of them, actually. Two winners. And we're going to give these away. This is a lovely pouch that will work with your AMT hardballer. If anybody out there has one, hopefully our winners have an AMT hardballer. If not, uh, we'll just pick somebody else's name. <laughs> it's actually a almost single stack 1911 mag yeah. should but, fit this but pouch. But these stickers were made in 1987, so right. they say AMT hardballer. Right. right. And interestingly enough, uh, much like my favorite beer, this was assembled in Mexico. So oh, it says right here huh. on the sticker. But right. anyway, uh, so we have this awesome Safari Land gear. And our first winner is Paul Bisman from Facebook. Yay, Paul! So, Paul, you'll get this. We'll be contacting you on Facebook in a totally non-creepy and appropriate way to get your information where we can send this to. Uh, and then we, our next winner is from YouTube, and I'm not sure if it's a robot. Right. Because it's R one D V or in alphanumerics that would be Romeo one Delta Victor. So if you're R one D Yeah, there we go. So Vic will be soon. R one D V, uh tell C three PO to get ready. <laughs> We're gonna contact you by YouTube message. Do people still do that? And try to get your information and we'll send you one of these awesome pouches as well. And how these work so say you're a Glock guy and you get one of these pouches, you then go to your wife slash significant other and say, oh, honey, well, I've got a mag pouch for a 1911 now. I need to buy one. Exactly. So yeah. just remember that. All right. Yeah. So these are our awesome giveaways from Safari Land, and we definitely want to thank them for supporting Power Factor Show and the shooting sports in general. Thank you, Safari Land, and thank you to Paul and C-3PO for watching. All right. So... Awards and prizes. Now, this was your idea, so why don't you take us take off from there? Well, kind of in line with our theme, at least initially, where we started off with things that you can expect at a match or what to expect after you get to the match. One of the things that you'll find, at, at least what purport to be major matches, is awards and prizes. Now, at the local level... Well, let's talk about a major... What is a major match? Well, That's kind of a... Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, for IDPA, I would say it would be a sanctioned match, right. which could be a state championship, a regional, or national championship. In USPSA, I have found matches, even at the local level, that will have awards. Mm -hmm. and so One like, of our local clubs does. Yeah, I mean, it used to be, in our section, when we had... Uh, I mean, the six... I guess they're all still active in our section... If people waited around an hour after teardown for the award for the uh, match results to be processed, the clubs would hand out uh, little pins. That's cool. On scene, and every club handed out pins, and to a large extent, everybody hung around to get them. And then uh, at some point, people just stopped hanging around. The pins are kind of expensive, so they stopped giving them away. All those young whippersnappers are you? Yeah, that, you exactly. know, Same guys drinking. that didn't pick up my brass. They don't want the pins either. Well, so. at least they're not picking up your brass. Well, but no, picking it up to give it back to me. Oh, that was not another tradition. It back. That was another tradition in the section. Is as you were shooting or scoring, somebody was walking along behind you, picking up your mags and picking up your brass and giving you the whole thing. And you, now you're stuck fending for yourself if you want your brass. I usually get my mags back, but I'm also well, the, the mags, only guy. Yeah, generally, yeah. I'm the only guy shooting a yeah. Glock 21. So, so anyway, so depending on. What kind of a match you're attending, who the sanctioning body is, and what kind of awards the organizers want to give out, you can find uh, awards for uh, order of finish, mm -hmm. and then you can also have a prize table. Yay, prize and table. Prize tables are kind of fun, but they're controversial. I mean, I think no matter mm -hmm. how you give out prizes, no matter how they're organized, somebody is going to be unhappy with it. Absolutely. Well, and you have two different methods for get primary methods for giving out prizes. Uh, if you go to, we'll use an area match as an example. So for USPSA, for the new guys who are watching this, USPSA has several different tiers of matches. So level one is your club match. That's a local, you know, your friendly shoot. Level twos are going to be your state section championships and your special matches. So double tap is a level two match, the Washington State Championship, which we don't actually have. Well, we have the North 
Northwest the, Challenge, right. which kind of, you know, at least on the western side of the mountains, takes is sort of the state right. championship. Uh, so if you know, the uh, the Great Plains sectional, which I'll probably be shooting this year for undisclosed reasons, will uh, is in is a level two match. And then you have your area matches. Those are your level three matches. Level four matches are reserved for national championships, and level fives are world championships. Uh, well, there is actually a world championship held in the United States every year. Steel Challenge oh. is a level five USPSA match. Nice. It is the Steel Challenge World Championship. So, uh, but a, a level three match is a good example because those will usually have a respectable prize table. There's uh, sponsor support and that sort of thing. So, and that that's an issue as well. Mm-hmm. Is that the the prize table can be funded by match entry fees, right? And or it can be supplemented or provided exclusively by match sponsors. Right. So you could have a major match uh, with uh, a shooter-funded prize table that has a fairly hefty match fee. Mm-hmm. And you could also have a ma- fairly major match with, with a uh, very modest match fee if the sponsors come through with a lot of the prizes. Now, what would you consider a modest match fee? I would cons- if if I am if it's any build is any kind of a championship, mm-hmm. you know, where people are going to travel out of state to go to it. I would say a hundred dollars is a modest match fee. So when I think modest match fees, and this is I blame Steel Challenge for this because the match fees for Steel Challenge are obscene. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Bianchi Cup is a good example. So if you shoot production division at Bianchi Cup, it's a two hundred fifty dollar match fee, which seems to me to be a fairly reasonable match fee for that. Plus, Bianchi's got a lot of extras. So every shooter gets... The thing about Bianchi, then we'll get into this, is every shooter gets a shooter's bag Mm -hmm. at Bianchi Cup. The shooter's bag that I get at Bianchi Cup is generally better than the prize tables at a lot of other matches that I go to. And if the prize table is proportional to the match fee, I I think that takes the place of... uh, You know, generally, when I'm trying to evaluate whether a match is worthwhile, I look at the total cost. Sure. But then if I'm going to go to a match where there's a $200 match fee, there'd better be some bling for everybody. There better be something coming back. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, you know, I mean, I've been to matches where everybody had a mag pouch, you know, stuck in their shooter, shooter's pack. It's generally got the match booklet and maybe your uh, barcode stickers to go on your uh, score sheets mm-hmm. and maybe the score sheets. But they'll usually be catalogs and stuff right. stuffed in there. But sometimes there'll be some stuff. You know, I mean, it's, sometimes it'll be a bottle of oil or a recoil mm-hmm. spring or something. But, you know, I mean, when I'm looking at the match, the reputation it has for its prize table and then valuing that uh, vis-a-vis the match fee, sure. that's an important consideration. So back to... <clears throat> Uh, prize distribution. So you have two methods that it's generally done by. And there's some subcategories in both of those methods as well. So there's random drawing of prizes, which is... It's a random drawing. That's Names doing the hat. Yeah. Uh, under, that, so under that heading, I've seen two different ways off the top of my head. Uh, I've seen where every shooter gets a raffle ticket or a number of raffle tickets. And so uh, the one the way I was first introduced to it was in an IDPA match where your match fee got you 10 raffle tickets. And then you went to the prize table and you put your tickets in the buckets for whatever prize you wanted. So, so it was still random... Right, but you still had it. You could you heavily some, weight the right. price that you were interested. In. So you know, if you really wanted those Safari Land mag pouches, for instance, for yeah. instance yeah. you could throw all ten of your tickets in there and have a very good chance at that. Or if yeah. you want to, you know, hold out for the Glock certificate or whatever. Right. So that was the first way I saw random drawings, uh, and then I've just seen random drawings based on you're a shooter at the match. Congratulations, you're entered in the random drawing. Right. Uh, I I like the first method more because I feel like it's a little bit more participatory. Uh, but the other method for distributing prizes is order of finish. Well, uh, uh, is there another random the, drawing? The Lewis system, which oh. I think is what they use at the GSSF matches. Ah, yes, the Lewis system. Well, that's sort of a subheading of order of finish. I, th- I would have considered a subheading of random. Aren't, aren't the prize winning places assigned in advance? And then if you luck into those finishing places, you get the prize? Uh, yes. So how the Lewis, well, so, and this is actually why I would consider it order of finish. So how the Lewis system works is if you have, it's usually what you do is you have uh, X number of shooters 
and for whatever it is, you're going to go x over three. So every so you're going to divide those into thirds. All right. So number one gets a prize, right. and then if you have ten shooters, the number you know, or if you have thirty shooters, the number ten gets sure. a prize, and then the winner of that next bunch, the so number twenty one or whatever, right. gets a prize as well. Right. And that's your that's your Lewis system right, right. there. But you could also tweak that and and distribute the prizes. Oh, certainly. More heavily weighted for order of finish, mm-hmm. or more heavily weighted in terms of distributed evenly throughout the shooting population, right. or whatever. Lewis allows a lot more wiggle room than the other uh, order of finish distribution methods. Right. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like the Lewis is because, like, the last time I ran a match where I could decide how the prizes were awarded, I gave the first place shooter a prize. Mm-hmm. Figured he wins, he should get a prize. Agreed. And then fourth place because I figured, you know, he's somebody that did really pretty darn well, but it's not quite an order of finish prize. It's still sort of random. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no way you can plan to finish in fourth place. But then I also gave prizes to, like, number 12 and number 29. Sure. So there's still an element of randomness in there for everybody that's involved in the match. And so I, I kind of like the Lewis system as long as everybody understands in advance that those positions were picked in advance. In advance, right. So, and then you have your order of finish, which is, there's two ways, again, that I've seen that done. So the, I would say the most common way, and there's a lot of variation in this, but generally what you see is either pure order of finish. So that's first through 239th, and that's how uh, Steel Challenge, for example, awards there's prizes. No, there's no classes, right? Well, there actually are classes are in Steel classes. Challenge, yeah. They disregard but that for the prizes? What they do for the prize table is when you enter Steel Challenge, you pick a one of your classes as your main match gun. All right, so my main match gun is going to be, you know, if I'm shooting production and, you know, uh, IDPA, ESP are my two divisions, I pick one of those, and then I get called to the line based on whatever my best finish, or based on whichever one of those was my main match gun. And that's where I'm going to end up in the prize table. Okay. Uh, The... Uh, Bianchi Cup does the same thing where they also have the prize table for overall order of finish as well as random giveaways. Uh, So they do the best of both worlds, and you can pick your main match gun, and wherever you finish determines whether or not you get a prize. So, uh, be, so Steel Challenge, they've got all the classes and divisions. The winners of each class and division get additional prizes, but those are uh, those are usually donated by whatever company sponsoring that division. Right. So okay. if you win production, you get a cash prize, and then you know maybe a Glock or something like that based on the sponsor. Right. Uh, so that's still challenge, and that's you know pure overall order of finish. Pro Am does it the same way for the amateur divisions. The pros are playing for cash, so there's no prize table for them. But at the Pro Am, the prize table is walked purely in order of finish. Okay. They split it into both divisions. So open walks the open prize table, mm-hmm. and limited walks the limited prize table. Which are equivalent. Roughly. Yeah, basically they're same yeah. diff uh, yeah. prize tables. Then you have the USPSA prize distribution method, which I can never actually remember. But I think it's first. Actually, you know what? I take that back. Pro Am's not actually order of finish. So it's first through X. Uh, so it's proportional to number of shooters. Well, yeah. So basically, yeah. what Pro Am does is it goes first GM, first M, first A, first B, first C, first D, and then it does second. I think it does first through third in all of those, and then it's order of finish after that. Okay. So that's pro am. Sorry, and then USPSA I think is similar. Yeah, I think uh, I know. Like for the awards, mm-hmm. they give out like top sixteen overall. Sixteen for some reason is the cutoff, right? And then you've it used got, to be during shoot off days. That's why they had sixteen. Oh, because they Cause were eligible for the the, the shoot off, and oh, you okay. could get sixteen guys into a bracket. Okay, and then um, they start. You know, certain categories maybe get to pick before certain class winners. Right. But, you know, essentially, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've been involved in a, in a prize drawing that was supposed to be based on order of finish, but then also with the different classes kind of broken out. So okay. That, you know, I think first A maybe went to the prize table before first D or whatever. I mean, it was supposed One to be hope so. some semblance of kind of rewarding uh, the higher you finished. But they also have, I've seen some weird deals where they've got, you know, like two prize tables going simultaneously, um, where it was almost like the person who's finished first on the first page is the first draw on this table, and the person who was first on the second page is on this table, when the person on the second page obviously was like 50th overall. Right. So it's just kind of weird how you actually see it. And one of the fun things that happened down at the double tap 
is they posted the order in which everybody would draw in advance. They did that at Pro-Am. So you go up to the wall and see, well, I'm going to draw 237th. I'm out of here. Yeah, I don't exactly. have to wait around two hours to see when I'm going to go to the price table. Because I've been to a match where I literally sat there waiting for two hours for my name to be called. And I just thought, you know, whatever's left on the price table, I'm not going to wait around half an hour to find out what it is. Yeah. And I just took off. So it's nice if it's some kind of a system where you know in advance where you're going to draw. And if you don't want to stick around, you can take off. You can go out and have lunch and come back or whatever, you know. I got to say, I was pretty low on the prize table at Steel Challenge. I still got to the prize table, and I ended up with a, an Advantage Arms uh, 22 kit for my Glock. A decent prize for my finish. Yeah. So there are, and th- that's one of the other things, is some prize tables totally worth sticking around for. I would say Steel Challenge, even if you're really, really low on the totem pole, it's worth sticking around for that prize table. Pro-Am is the same thing. Uh, it's a, it's ve- generally a very strong table. Um, other matches, probably not so much. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I like about the random draw, and in the last couple of years that, that we've done the IDPA uh, championship here, is rather than have you know 150 people waiting for their name to be drawn, mm-hmm. Other than the highest valued prizes, we distributed everything in the goodie bags. So when you got your goodie bag, you'd have your score sheets and your barcodes and your catalogs. But then you also might have a, um, you know, something like this in there, or you might have something. I mean, we were giving away in the goodie bags, you know, hundred dollar bullet discount certificates oh, cool. and stuff. And so the, the prize drawing, since it was for the stuff that was worth, you know, guns and stuff. The drawing only took 20 minutes. Oh, no, thank you know? God. And and so that way we cut, you know, an hour and a half out of the match time. People mm-hmm. were able to go home at 5.30 instead of 7.30. And I think that's a great way to do it because it's just, it's a lot of the stuff people either are going to want it or not anyway. And so I maybe would end up on the prize table getting a Glock recoil spring anyway. So you might as well stick it in the bag. You know? Sure. So that works out pretty well. We'll be right back with more on prize tables after this message from Hodgson, the gunpowder people. So uh, so we so where we, we ended up talking. I said we were, we were talking, talking about, about the value of random draw and how right. putting the stuff in the goodie bags is good a way as any if you're going to just distribute uh, sure. randomly. So speaking of random drawings, one of the other ways I've seen it done is they'll do the draw while everyone's shooting. Oh. So everyone will, you know, dur- before the shooters meeting, everyone fills out their cards and throws them down. And then when you go, you go out and shoot, and they do the and the range staff does the drawing. And then when everyone comes up, you know, to wait for the scores and all of that, then they're like, okay, now that you're done waiting, you know, you're waiting for scores. While you're waiting, guess what we've got? Prizes. Yeah. Well, see, now we would do it the other way around because oh, you nobody would wait for scores. Nobody would wait around <laughs> for the scores if we didn't have them waiting for the prizes. Well, this was well. an IDPA match, so they still yeah. had so they had to wait for the scores, and then they had to wait to get their well, plaques the, and stuff. Because, yeah, but because the prizes are random, you can do the prizes before they, before the results are done. True. So we would always, you know, we've got people that this, one of the, we would also hook them into tearing the range down. Ah, which sneaky, a lot, sneaky. And that's another thing about prize tables and major matches is mm-hmm. a lot of people have this sense that at, either after I've paid a certain amount for my match or after I've traveled a certain distance to my match, I'm not doing any tear down. Fair enough. And I think at the same time, though, uh, you're sitting around anyway. I mean, we've never had any problem at our state championship match mm-hmm. of saying, okay, the results are going to be done in about a half an hour. So in that half hour, if everybody would just put away a target stand or something, we'll have this thing torn down in no time. And a match that it took us, you know, four days to set up is torn down in 20 minutes. God. And, and the, for the staff that's been there for four days already, oh, yeah. having the thing already torn down and put away when, when the awards are done, it's a it's a huge benefit. Absolutely, so I, I think I I think as a match organizer, if you can put your people to work while they're waiting for those awards and prizes, I think it's really worthwhile. Speaking of that, how do you feel about incentivizing uh, match staff with special giveaways and that sort of thing? We Ad- have always at our matches had a separate party and prize drawing for the staff. And I, I that's agree just, with that. You know, it it it. it, it the staff actually has, if you're looking at it, it's kind of like the cost to benefit ratio or mm-hmm. return on investment. The staff actually has a better chance of winning a, a nice prize. Sure. Just because, you know, I mean, I think a lot of these guys are taking, you know, three or four days off of work and coming out to the range and spending, you know, literally, uh, like they're living at the range for three or four days. And I think they do it anyway. But as match it's director, nice. I always felt like these guys are got to take care of them, you know. Yeah. And so we would put on like a we'd have lunch every day for the guys in the setup crew, and then like a maybe 
a month after the match, everybody get together at a little cool, uh, restaurant or something, and we do a separate prize drawing. Cool. And it, I, I think that's the way to go. I mean, I, I went uh, and shot uh, a USPSA's uh, national and worked the match a few years ago. And it was the same deal. They had like a banquet mm-hmm. and a prize drawing and stuff. And I think that's great. I mean, it's the camaraderie aspect of it is important. But um, I think it's just this idea that you're taking care of the people who are working for you, I think, is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. At Pro-Am, they, did this, they had two helper squads that went around with a super squad and helped them reset all their steel because they shot so much more steel than everyone else. Uh-huh. And then they had separate prizes for the ROs. And then if you volunteered to be on one of the helper squads, they had a gun for, you know, uh, each of those two helper squads. So if right. you're on the helper squad, you're a one in six chance of winning a gun. So that's good. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've shot. I've couple, volunteered for that. I was like, yeah. sure. I'll I mean, reset I've, Dave I've shot Steel. matches where just my my walk of the prize table earned me something that was worth more than my match. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that's not unusual. You don't have to. You don't even have to play all that well for that to be the case. Yeah. At some matches, and so it's just a matter of when you go to the match or you're planning to go to a match. If you look at and say, "Boy, that match fee seems really high," especially if you're used to shooting local matches for fifteen bucks, mm-hmm. you see there's a championship match next in the next state over. The match fee is one hundred and fifty bucks. You know, sometimes there's a good reason for it to be that high, and a lot of times it's the price table that affects the price. You'll see matches that have really lavish price tables, and the match fees seem really high. But if you go and shoot the match, you're likely to get a good return on that investment. Absolutely. Now, speaking of prizes, let's talk about not necessarily prizes in the sense of, you know, you're getting a gun or, you know, a certificate a for bullets, right, or a yeah, recoil spray. A little spray, bottle of oil. A little bottle of, of Brownells oil. Yeah. I got a range bag once at a match. That was cool. Yeah. The big Brownells range bag and then my cat peed on it. So yeah. I got a new range bag after that. Right. Uh, but let's talk about trophies and plaques. Now, okay, so now we're segueing into awards. Awards, right. right. So this is Northwest 2001. You know what I was doing in 2001? Uh, junior high school. No, no, oh. no. I was actually in college, oh, so okay. you know, don't feel that bad. Yeah, I just think but you know. my girlfriend was in high school. No, junior high school. Actually, I don't want to... Let me think about that for a minute. She doesn't watch the show, so I can get away okay. with this. Okay, good. But, uh, you know, obviously both the two major sports, USPSA and IDPA, have kind of differing theories on how awards are given away. Yes. You could say that. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think I personally look at at the awards as that's when the winners get their recognition. Sure. They go up in front of the crowd. There's the roar of the applause. Maybe they get to make a little speech. They get to shake the match director's hand and they hand them, you know, something like this. Right. And, and that's... That's what the winners get. I mean, that, that's the way I look at it. And that's one of the things about this, the, the distinguishing between awards and prizes. Sure. And, and I do. I mean, I think they're kind of, to a certain extent, they're two separate things. But the awards are generally the, the, the manner in which you determine who gets an award differs you know, across all the different sports. Absolutely. And I think, you know, like in the IDPA rule book, it says essentially you will give one third of the competitors awards. Yep. You know, I mean, it's one award easy. for every three competitors. Yeah. And it's uh, the division winner is declared the winner. Right. And then you go right to class awards. Yep. There's no second overall, third overall. You'll have your match winner regardless of class. And then from there, it goes straight to class awards. And so it's really first easy. through. If you, yeah, first one third. Right. I mean, I've done this literally 10 times. You've got, uh, 15 shooters, you're going to give out first through fifth. Right. You know, in, in a given class. And so it's it's all done for you. You know, you don't have this sense of, uh, well, you know, does that guy deserve, a, you know, because I know like a lot of times we do the three, five, seven mm-hmm. deal where you don't get an award unless there's three shooters. You have right. to beat two people to get an award. And if you're going to go to second place, there's got to be five. And then uh, other times it's, so three, five, seven, it's like, you know, five, seven, nine, or whatever. Sure. You, you can do it however you want, depending on how deserving you want or you think the winners should be. Because I know a lot. I mean, I've had a match where I literally was giving out ninth place in class, and some people, you know, maybe that they've never gotten a pri- an award before. That's going to be their most cherished piece of eight and a half by eleven paper. But other people are like, "On you got to be kidding! You expect me to come up there and be recognized for ninth overall?" You know, it's like that. Uh, the um, the Fockers. Right, the guys. You know, it's like I didn't know His they wall- made prizes for ninth overall. Exactly. Kind of thing, yeah, you know? and so it's uh, you know, but I think it, 
the rules say that's how you give it out, so you give them out. You know, and I actually have... I've gone back and forth on this issue personally, and I'm a little bit closer to the give out, you know, 14th place sharpshooter trophies now. Uh, when I was at the you internationals, know, I was uh, I was chatting with Julie uh, Golub about this, and I was of the opinion that you know, give out first through fifth. You know, if there's 20 or 30 shooters in a class, first through fifth is fine. If there's less than 10 shooters, give me first through third. Mm-hmm. All right, and that was that was how I felt. And she made a very valid point that not everyone who's doing this is as serious about it as you are or as I am. Sure. And so for a guy who has a 9 to 5 job and is an accountant, he comes out, he shoots one match a month, and then one year he's like, damn it, I'm going to the indoor nationals this year. You know, it's in Massachusetts. I live in Connecticut. It's not far. You know, right. He drives up and he makes the match. And, you know, he shoots okay. You know, he doesn't, you know, blow anyone's doors off. And he finishes... 10th sharpshooter, Mm -hmm. he goes back and he gets a little plaque and he put it in his office. That's cool. That's a good, you know, and and, it's a hook. If if there's 20 sharpshooters and you finish 10th, I mean, I've shot plenty of matches where I finished in the middle of my class, and that's not to say I would necessarily want an award for it, but again, depending on, you know, if you've got, like, I know... um, Oh, God, there were like 40 SSP sharpshooters. uh, I shot the 2004 Area 1 and finished 3rd A. I shot the 2006 area one was second A, 2007 area one I was first A. And so you can think of it as an incentive. Mm-hmm. You know, that 10th that sharpshooter can either be, you can hide it under your desk or you can pin it on the wall, you know, next to your like, dry fire target. I will get this thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Motiv- it can act as motivation, you know. And so there, it, it's not like it, I feel you can necessarily w- determine for yourself based on your value system what is going to be a worthwhile award for somebody else. But I think, you know, since IDPA tells you what it's going to be, it takes it out of your hands. Absolutely. Yeah, and I definitely feel now that, you know, again, for those guys who may not be as serious about it, you know, it's a great hook. I think that IDPA provides that, you know, someone comes in and they're like, you know what, I got a a little plaque. Well, next year I want to get a bigger plaque. Sure. And And they may keep coming back. Or that may be their crowning moment of, you know, that may be their touchdown pass in the end zone in high school. So, you know what? Whatever makes people happy. Now, USPSA is different, and I still, to this, I've read the rule, I read the rule book on it before I came over here, and I was still like, what? It's... It's the winner, so, you know, the first place winner gets, you know, I am the champion trophy at at nationals. Anyway, he gets his I am the champion trophy. Then the top 16 in the division, regardless of class, class, are all given medals or trophies or whatever. Then you have class finish as well is taken into account. So first A, uh, and now USPSA uses the... You've got to have a minimum number of competitors to give out a certain number of trophies, right? I think it's three, five, seven right. for awards. I used to do the um, the awards for our local sectional championship, and we used to have awards were based on three, five, seven. Speaking of which, you guys should see this. Well, he, I'm going to grab this while he's talking because this is. I've seen a lot of shooting trophies. This is actually awesome. I mean, this is cool. It's a wood pepper popper. It's got a little. It's got some bling bling up here. That is. That's pretty nice. I wish we we gave out awards on a three five seven basis, right? And then we had cash payouts. Okay. But that was on a different standard. Okay. It was like two five seven nine or something. So you wouldn't get any cash unless there were five shooters. But the guy who got second place cash was not the same guy necessarily who got the second place award. Got it. And so it was like two. I had two sets of uh, of the finishing results, and then had to calculate two separate. Uh, that sounds awful. It was kind of weird. It was very weird because, of course, you then also had to shoot a minimum number of matches in the six-match series to qualify. Right. So you could have a guy who had a better score, but if he hadn't shot the minimum qualifying number of matches, you took him out of the out of maybe one of the set of results and maybe out of both. You know, and it was just. It was, it was kind of weird. I had that happen to me last year. Since I, got the order, since I was in charge of ordering the awards, I got the really nice award. Yeah, It's beautiful. But, of course, you know, and these are these are pretty expensive. I mean, that's the other thing. That's like consider. $10 whole dollars. No, this was like $40. Seriously? Yeah. Holy hell. Yeah, this is $10. Ah, uh, the certificate. The certificate. And you, and which now, I'm a big fan Did of. you frame that yourself? I, I think it came with the frame that the champions... The champion's got the frame. The champion. I got a certificate yeah. from the Yakima Summer Steel Classic for second open. Yeah. And it was about that big. And it was just a little piece of paper. And I'm like, 
I have a frame that just fits and I'll put it well, on the wall. Well, the thing I like about the, the certificate is if you're really proud of it, you can frame it exactly. and hang it on the wall. And if you don't, it's a 25 cent piece of paper and you can throw it away. I mean, I've seen plenty of these get thrown away. And so um, I think the certificates are a nice balance. And especially if you can, you know, do them in color and mm-hmm. especially if it's got the shooter's name on it. I mean, I think it really, it looks nice, but it costs next to nothing. I mean, if you're a match administrator and you're casting about trying to decide what to do for awards... Um, we've been giving out plaques to the division winners right. and then certificates to everybody else. And I think it works out really well. I mean, I think it's kind of proportional to the to the, the gravity or immensity of the award. One of the coolest trophies I've ever seen outside of the Bianchi Cup, where it's actually a silver cup, uh, was uh, the Virginia State IDPA match, actually. I was in the area, and I got to shoot it last year. And the division champion got a glass plaque that was in the shape of the state of Virginia. Oh. I, I was like, that's pretty cool. I, I yeah. thought that was pretty sick. It was well set up. <laughs> yeah, this, the awards that we gave out last August for our state championship was a wooden plaque in the shape of the state mm. with the laser engraving. Yeah. And that, that turned out really nice. I mean, I think there's a lot of different things you can do. I mean, in our section... Uh, we tend to get bogged down in the wood plaque with uh, either colored or otherwise engraved uh, uh, applique on it. Yeah. This is probably the standard issue shooting sports plaque right yes. here. I have more of yes. these for different, you know, I if you look at all of them like from this, I, <laughs> I've got a bunch of these and I turn it and it's like uh, USPSA, uh, Steel Challenge, yeah. uh, IDPA, yeah. you never so that know. is kind of the industry standard. It though. is. But I mean, you can get creative and I think this is kind of a cool one. I like that. Little loose sight thing with the applique uh, on the back. But, I mean, I've seen stuff like uh, the medals, the medallions. Mm-hmm. You know, we had those um, Oregon State uh, single-stack match. They gave out medallions a few years ago. So there's all kinds of things you can do. I mean, I think I, I was even considering having some T-shirts made for the awards rather mm. than just as a, a souvenir for everybody. You know, get the get a logo. I mean, it, it could get kind of pricey, I think. But certainly distinctive. Yeah. You know, the only one like it. So different things you can do. But, again, the awards are one of those things where, you know, it's, uh, it's an incentive for people to compete. It can be really cool to get up in front of the crowd, you know, and, you know, and I shake this. the match director's hand. I mean, I, when I shot the Nationals in 06 uh, in Oregon, Mike Voigt was there. Um, he handed out the awards. I could shake his hand. And uh, Mike Voigt being the former uh, USPSA president who lives nowhere near Oregon. Right. And so it was kind of cool. You know, I mean, if you're shooting, you're, if you're in any sport, how often do you get the president of the organization to show up for the awards ceremony? So it was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's just the awards can be a big deal, even if it's not like when, when we don't have these pre-printed certificates. We'll just make a quick and dirty copy on a black and white printer and then mail the final certificates out. But we want the people to come up and get the applause and yeah, everything. And we just hand them a piece of paper that says, you know, yeah, you were third overall. And, you know, it's cool. I think, that, I think that's the value of the awards is the recognition of the other shooters, whether you spend any money on the actual award itself or not. Absolutely. So back to prizes, kind of to wrap things up. You know, obviously there's pros to random order in that anybody could get a prize. You know, there's cons to it in that maybe the top shooters who, you know, shot really well and shot a great match might feel cheated out of it. Uh, And, you know, same with order of finish. You know, then the guy who drives all this way for a match to shoot and have fun, he's got no juice to come back to that match again the next year. I think probably the best... The best system I've seen across the shooting sports is, you know, throw a shout out to my friends at NRA and the Bianchi Cup because they do order of finish prizes. They do prize money as well. So, for example, if you finish uh, third production marksman at Bianchi Cup, you will get a check. It won't be a very big one, mm-hmm. but you'll get a check in the mail later, yeah. and you'll get a little plaque, and you'll get to shake hands with uh, Tom Hughes, who's a great guy, runs the program, and uh, you know it's great. And then you're also entered in all of these random giveaways. So last year they gave away ten or fifteen guns at random. Mm-hmm. My shooter's bag had a two hundred dollar pair of Rudy sunglasses in it and just a bunch of other stuff. So it is the best giveaways, you know, and mm-hmm. then but again you still have order of finish and you've got cash sure. money going to people based on how well they finished. So I think that's 
in my opinion, that's probably the best balance. The mm -hmm. top finishers are rewarded with prizes and cash for how well they've done, and there's still that random chance that, you know, I may get the... And the shooter's bags are all different, by the way. They've all got some of the same stuff, but, you know, one bag may have... Uh, I got a bag one year that had like four Glock mags in it. I'm like, yeah, sweet. Glock mags, yay! You want a Glock, especially. Especially, yeah. Well, and what's funny is they do the, kind of a side note, they do the shooter's bags uh, the night before the event starts. So yeah. everyone goes in and registers, gets their shooter's bags, and there's a reception out in the hotel. It's all in the match hotel. Where everybody's swapping. And everyone's like, oh, you've got a Glock? Here you go. Oh, you got two 1911 mag pouches. Yeah. I'll trade you a Glock mag for your mag pouches. And it's just, yeah. you know, big old open air swap me. And that's one of the things that I thought, you know, some people were spring Bringing up the point that what if you give four Glock mags to the guy who doesn't own a Glock? He'll find somebody to trade He'll find somebody, he'll to find somebody with, yeah. who does. Yeah. And so I thought that's, you know, if you're trying to get people to kind of mix and, uh, you know, spend some time socializing, that aspect of it works out pretty well. Because then you've got a, a nice uh, conversation starter with who needs four Glock mags. Yeah. You know. I've seen people win guns at matches and just turn around and be like, 400 bucks, you know, because they've got a certificate. Speaking of which, if you're the match organizer, it's way easier to get certificates from SIG and Glock and all these people than actual freaking guns, because then your shooters can take the certificates home and do that and deal with the logistics on their own. Okay. Yeah, get certificates. I've seen people, but I've seen people do that at matches, turn around, 400 bucks for the SIG, and just, you know, deal with it right there, because they we, don't want to deal with it. We had a, um, one of the prizes at our state championship match. It was distributed randomly was uh, an AR, like a monolithic AR upper oh, with, a, cool. with a rail and a, and a lower. And I was looking at retail prices, and it was priced, I think it was like 800 bucks or something. And the person who won it had no clue what it was. And before she even had taken two steps away from the here's your prize, she'd sold it to somebody for 100 bucks. What? So somebody else got a prize. They yeah, got no an eight hundred dollar uh, AR for uh, hundred bucks. So, Man, I don't even have. A, I don't even have anything to say it was about kind that. Of fun, That's I kind guess of for him. The, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Wow. We'll, we'll identify him later. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so the price table thing. There's a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. If you're a shooter going to a match um, and you're considering it, you know, I often cons I, I generally look at the match at what's the reputation of the club. You know, what kind of matches have they had in the past. Um, what am I likely to find there in terms of the quality of the stages? But then I'll also look at a certain balance of match fee and what am I going to get for my match fee? You know, I'm not going to pay $250 probably to go to a match anywhere. But if a match is, I've been to a match where the, it, there was a $60 match fee and no prize table. Mm -hmm. And I've been to a match where there was a $60 prize fee, uh, match fee and they're giving guns away. Yeah. And so, you I've know, seen it's both. just, you know, it, it's kind of a crapshoot. And that's one of those things to consider, especially if you're not kind of, not really familiar with how the system works. If you're going to go to a match and you want to see what's the return going to be on my investment, sometimes it can be really first-rate match production. Other time it can be first-rate price table. Sometimes both. Sometimes neither. So. And I got to say, I am willing to pay money, uh, more money for a good match, like a well set up. And I'm not, I don't just mean good stages, but I mean well run, well executed, and just professional match with maybe an average price. I would pay more money for a great match with an average price table than I would pay for uh, an average match with a great price table. Sure. I would yeah. much rather have the shooting challenge and have a good match experience than, you know, have an awesome prize table. Yeah. And that's that's me personally because, uh, you know, some guys are more prize motivated. Some guys would rather pay <laughs> that money to go to a match with, you know, an awesome prize table. Especially if they have an expectation of winning. Exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. So that's about it for this week. Rick, you got anything else? Uh, well, there is one thing since we're talking about awards and prizes. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, you'll notice, hasn't been with us the last few weeks. And that's because he's had to take up a part-time job. In help, South Seattle, shake yeah, it in. Help to finance the show. So if you'd like to see Steve back, hit that donate button. Uh, the, the show, as you can see, our lavish set here. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the expense that we've gone to to create this. But Pennies. Uh, if, you, if, if you want to see the continued <laughs> massively awesome show, and the high production values that we have here, hit that donate button and uh, help us buy beer. Keep the Power Factor show coming. So until next week, I'm Rick. I'm Caleb. And, and you can find us on powerfactorshow.com. Right. You can send us emails at powerfactorshow at gmail.com. Or facebook.com slash powerfactorshow. Thanks for watching, everybody. See ya.